brought to you by Local Video Magazine. Kim here, Hockey Mom RD. I had to show you what we found in the grocery store tonight. This was a find from when the boys were little. They love these uh, Dole fruit snacks. They're 100% natural, no artificial colors. Each bag contains about three servings. A serving is 21 of those little cubes that you see there in, the, in my one third cup measure. That will provide your skater with 24 grams of carbohydrates, which is about uh, equal to one and a half slices of bread. This would be a good quick snack in that hour before ice time along with some water, provided they've eaten well throughout the rest of the day. I'm James Leslie from Toll Harbor, Nova Scotia, and I love Florida. Picture that each defender has three vulnerable areas. Then, with a pair of obstacles arranged to simulate your opponent's skates, toss the ball through a slot and dodge around towards the opposite side. New players will get away with regularly throwing the puck through their opponent's skates. But, Advanced players will want to use the outside slots more often. In readiness to use this against an opponent, be sure to pull the stick quickly around so the defender isn't able to slow your move. Cupping over the puck is the only surefire way to cut without losing the puck or ball. Usually, Cutting towards the backhand is easy. However, really sharp cuts on the forehand require a different hand arrangement. So for this, slide the top hand under the other arm, as shown here. Continue cutting one way, and then the other, changing the hands each time you move towards the forehand side. Practice this one often until you can change your hands without even thinking. Defenders often move where they think you're going. So, try to develop some head fakes to make opponents think you're going one way when you really intend to pull the ball back and go the opposite way. Now, 
If you want something that really helps you develop soft hands, perform a toe pull and see if you can get the ball to roll up onto your stick blade. Gradually, as you get better at this, try to cradle the ball on the blade for several seconds before dropping it and then starting over again. Once you've seen these exercises, my suggestion would be for you to start with the first three or four and see if you can master them by practicing for a few minutes a day. Hey, a ball like this is small and it can be carried in your bag or even in your pocket, giving you the chance to practice any time the opportunity presents itself. Have fun with these exercises and know that playing the game is going to be a whole lot more fun as your stick handling skills improve. Over coming days and weeks, you might want to drop some drills for a while and substitute a few others in their place, continuing to do this until you feel you've mastered every skill in this program. Then, when you feel you're really ready, I have another 16 exercises that are aimed at taking you beyond incredible stick handling. Skating like a speed skater with hockey 
actually makes a hockey player a slower hockey player. And I'll show you why in a couple of slides. Makes you a slower hockey player. To talk about it briefly, one of the reasons that speed skaters skate the way that they do is purely for wind resistance and skating economy. Now, we want skating economy with hockey players, but we couldn't care less about wind resistance. With speed skaters, when they're skating anywhere from 500 to 10,000 meters, they want to be down as low as they can because they don't want a lot of wind resistance because literally wind resistance, even though they're skating inside, can play a major role on their speed but also their fatigue. So the, the fatigue is a really another big factor. And one of the reasons that speed skaters have that big long recovery is again to, to, to enhance their efficiency but also because they want to decrease their fatigue decrease their fatigue. And they can't take the short, the, the, the short strides, the short powerful strides. They have powerful strides, but they can't take the short powerful strides that are needed in hockey. So again, this is incorrect. A long recovery will make a hockey player a slower player. Excuse me. One of the biggest misconceptions, and the one that drives me absolutely bananas, crazy, I don't know if bananas translates, crazy, is that arm movement forward and backward, a lot of coaches and power skating instructors call it pull the rope, it looks like this. So the premise is that they think that if you are going forward, all of your movements should be forward, forward and backward. Well, literally, this is against the law of physics. Sir Isaac Newton, his third law was, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. In fact, hockey players literally and biomechanically cannot move their arms forward and back. It's impossible. And especially when they have two hands on their stick, they cannot move their arms forward and back. Think about this. Think about how ridiculous this looks. If you have your... Yeah, I'm just, do, I'm going to explain this and then put the microphone away. Think about how ridiculous this is if you have two hands on your stick. That's not skating, that's canoeing. That's kayaking. It's actually kayaking, right? You can't do that. We'll talk more about that in a second. So here it is. In order to develop high performance muscle memory, the hockey player must practice skills and movements that are used during a game. All right, now, let's start talking about some research. We'll have about two or three slides with research, and then we'll actually show, show a video which, which uh, corroborates the research. So, this is research that we did, and we published it in 1998 in a journal called the Sports Medicine and Training and Rehabilitation. And what we did is we analyzed NHL forwards in quarter-second increments. So, when I did my doctoral dissertation, the good news was that I watched hockey, and I watched a lot of hockey. The bad news is that I watched hockey in quarter second increments. So I had to drink a lot of coffee to stay awake to watch hockey in quarter second increments, all right? So what we came up with is we, we realized, now, based on that pilot study that I was talking about before, we identified that there were 27 important skating characteristics that are used by NHL forwards. 27 skating characteristics. We started with 54 and narrowed it down to 27. All right, so we have what we call timed skating characteristics. Now, if you just bear with me with these acronyms, this stands for two foot glide. This is what we call cruise strides, C, cruise strides. This is medium intensity skating. This is struggling for pucker position. So this is any time there is stick contact or body contact, struggling for puck or position. This is low intensity skating, backward skating, high intensity skating, a two foot stop, or actually two foot stationary. So you're just, you're just stationary on two feet. And then two foot glide with the puck. Now look what we found. The majority of the time that NHL forwards are on the ice, they are gliding on two feet. 39% of the time they are gliding on two feet. And I'll show you in a second, all right? 
16% uh, of the time, they are taking what we identified as cruise strides. So a cruise stride, we identified it as any stride to maintain speed or maintain position. So it could have been one stride, it could have been two strides. Typically it was like one to two strides to maintain position or maintain speed. Medium intensity skating was 10%, struggling for pocket position was around 10%. Low intensity skating was about 6.4%. Now, this is the one that we found interesting, that backwards skating and high intensity skating were almost identical. Now, when you first look at that, you're like, well, how can that be? How can they skate backwards as much as they skate forward? Maybe high intensity skating isn't that important for NHL forwards. And then we thought about it a little bit more, and the fact, the fact is that this actually makes perfect sense because they're not skating at a high intensity a great amount, but this may be the most important characteristic, the high intensity skating. I say a couple of people nodding their head in agreement. This may be the most important, but the fact remains they spend a lot of time on gliding on two feet. Now, just bear with me because not the next slide, but the next slide after that, you'll see how it's interspaced from the drop of a puck. So then, we had what we called frequency. So the, the time characteristics was how much time they spent in those characteristics. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, frequency characteristics were how many times the, the, the skating characteristic occurred, all right? So this is left crossover turn, left gliding turn, right crossover turn, right gliding turn, stop and start, forward to backward pivots, backward to forward pivots, left crossover turn of the puck, left crossover, left gliding turn of the puck, right crossover turn of the puck. So the first thing that we noticed is the NHL forwards turn left more than they turn right. But it was not statistically different. It, when we analyzed it statistically, it wasn't, it wasn't different but they had more crossover turns than they did gliding turns. They didn't stop and start very much. They had a fair amount of backwards, and they, they really don't carry the puck very much, which is something we already know. Now, this makes more sense. This is what happened with the NHL forwards that we, that we uh, analyzed from the drop of a puck. So 30 seconds from the drop of a puck, excuse me. Now this was, we analyzed centers, right wings, and left wings, and they had, we had an equal number of, from each, each position. So no matter what position they were in, from the drop of the puck, they started with, they struggled for pocket position. So the centers either had body contact or stick contact, and the wings had body contact or stick contact. Then they had a two foot glide, then they had a cruise stride, then they had a two foot glide, cruise stride, two foot glide, cruise stride, two foot glide, stride, two foot glide right? Does that kind of, kind of see a pattern there? So they, they stride and they glide, they stride and they glide, they stride and they glide. And they don't spend much time in each, two seconds, two seconds, one, 2.5, that was pretty high. One second, 2.5, one second, 2.5. The average amount of time they spent in the skating characteristics was 1.5 seconds, 1.5 seconds. And here's the last 16 characteristics. So they had a struggle for bucket position, finally a medium intensity skating, two foot glide, medium intensity, two foot glide, two strides, low intensity. So, out of, now this is the average out of 12 players with 24 second periods. We analyzed them in the second period because we thought that was kind of like a neutral uh, period. So this was the average, this is what we found to be the average. This one was the highest, 3.5. Now, here, here's what we come back to, it is, Balancing on one foot during quote unquote power skating important. Is it important to go down the ice like this? Is it important to go backwards like this? Or is it better to develop a balance on two skates? Let's take a look at this. Hockey players spend a lot of time on the ice gliding on two feet. Now, you probably can't see this, so I'm just going to have to do some housekeeping here. Excuse me. Dennis Chigatsolans.
the nature of our game, ranks with other high-level essays, authored by the likes of Gladwell, Percival, and Coyle. It's an in-depth study of our game, it's about the challenges players face in the heat of battle, and it's about the things that influence the way players need to train, both off, and on the ice. Get it now, and be well armed, to answer almost any question, that arises about our game. Assisted lunges, 
or I turn around and I do resistant lunges. Guys, horizontal vector. You got to te keep teaching your body how to handle a horizontal vector so you start handling momentum and your body can go ahead and control that momentum. Guys, that's going to be the key to your longevity is your ability to handle momentum. And the only way you're going to train your body to do that is using horizontal vectors, not just vertical weight-based vectors like dumbbells and kettlebells. You need to start incorporating more horizontal-based training. You also need to go ahead and allow yourself to rotate and turn. So now I can go ahead and I can put do a simple body weight squat, which is a vertical vector for my body weight, but I got a horizontal vector on it, so it's teaching me how to stabilize on this side while I'm doing a squat. Man, I hope you understand that because you know what? Horizontal vectors are huge to our ability to age gracefully and stay functionally strong. The last thing I want to talk to you about is changing tempos. We've talked a lot about our body's weaknesses and what's going to happen as we get older. And one of the things we talk about is response time. Our ability to respond to situations so that our muscles are ready to fire when we need it. Guys, work with different tempos. When you train with just dead weight, you can really only train with one tempo because dead weight is gravity dependent. Therefore, you're only going to push that weight so fast. But when you get with bands, all right, and you start training with bands, you can go ahead and work fast tempos. You can work really slow tempos. You can go ahead and work pulling motions and do it at a very slow tempo, or you can work at a quick tempo. But the point is, you can change your speeds. Changing speeds, both with the pulling or the concentric or the pushing concentric component, as well as the eccentric, the loading component, is going to make your response time stay strong, quick, effective. And guys, you just can't get that from dead weight training. So one of the things that I incorporate is making sure I'm always challenging my body with different tempos. Because I want my reactive time, my response time to stay good as long as possible. So there you go. So when you look at your strength training program as you get older, number one, Make sure there's body weight training involved. But if you can't do body weight training, hey, get assisted body weight training by bringing bands into it. Make sure your body is integrated and it's always using both lower body and upper body to do movements. Therefore, you're teaching yourself how to handle life. All right, You're teaching yourself to be very integrated and strong and you're not just sitting at a machine and isolating a muscle because muscles don't work in isolation. They never have and they never will. Make sure you're adding vectors onto your body that challenge you, not just vertical vectors like kettlebells and dumbbells, but add a band onto your hips and learn how to push and pull and lift with a horizontal vector on your body so your body learns and your muscles learn how to handle that force because you know what? It's that force that's probably going to get you in trouble. It's also that force that we lose as we get older. Yeah, we'll keep walking and keep handling vertical vectors, but you know, horizontal vectors, we don't train with it, we lose it. And lastly, don't always feel like you got to work with the same tempo, the same three seconds out, three seconds back. Nothing wrong with that, change it up. Challenge your body to work at different speeds and different tempos so your response time stays great. You keep working with this in your strength training programs, you're going to be extremely excited about how functionally you stay compared to maybe your older counterparts that are doing nothing but dead weight training. Give it a shot. Give it a chance. I think you'll be very excited about how those types of changes in your strength training program make you a lot fitter at 50 than you are.
and welcome to Talking NHL with John and Howie. Here's my brother Howie. Howdy, howdy. How are you doing? Good. No uh, mm. bow tie this week. No <laughs> bow tie this week. <laughs> um, trades, Howie. It, we are coming up on the trade deadline, and we have had some trades. Yeah, we got uh, just this, well, Monday trade deadline is arriving, and so far the... Only big trade, I want to say big trade, but the one that stands out for probably the both of us mm. is the trade made by uh, King sending Darcy Kemper to Arizona, which I do not understand. I figured when the Kings picked Kemper up, basically they were looking at him as their future. Oh, since sure. you know, like right, he's too. getting their age, he's getting more injury prone and then they turn around and do this and basically in my opinion get nothing in return (laughs) well they did get scott wedgwood a (laughs) goaltender and (laughs) thomas or uh, uh, tobias Ryder. Ryder, yeah um i i am still Loss for words on this because I I don't understand the trade and it it could be because of the cap hit that they took when they picked up Fanouf and Thompson yeah. maybe I, I, what gets me the, I mean I was upset when Minnesota traded Kemper to the Kings but I was happy for the Kings to get him because I kind of figured okay yeah they're gonna you know that's their future goaltender good for them. I like Kemper. I mean, he yeah. was played great here in Minnesota. Yeah. But I am almost actually more upset with this trade by the Kings than when he moved to Minnesota. Because <laughs> I just don't get it. I, I don't <laughs> either. Would... So there's got to be something else behind it. But um, but moving on real quickly, well, we have to talk about this one because this one happened yesterday. Was the... Uh, Derek Broussard trade to in a three-way trade to Pittsburgh. Um, uh, there was a three-way trade. Um, so Pittsburgh gets uh, uh, Broussard, Dunn, and Lindbergh, and a third-round pick. And the Senators got Ian Cole. Uh, Gustafson and a first round pick and a 2019 third round pick and then Vegas Golden Knights got Ryan Reeves and a 2018 fourth round pick this really helps out Pittsburgh really quick who's yeah. already playing really well right now so there you could tell they're getting ready to yeah, I think it's going to help them yeah it's going to it's it's going to help them a lot. And I'm sure they're going to probably make more moves over the weekend. I wouldn't be surprised. Right. And, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. But I think it will, that will help. Yeah, absolutely. But we will cover all this on our podcast, the Puck Drops Here, dot, uh, Puck Drops Here podcast. And we'll catch you all next time right here on Talking NHL with John and Howie. We bid you all adieu. This programming is brought to you by Local Video Mag.